Hi, I'm Daniel Chan from UNSW Sydney. Welcome to another adventure in pure mathematics. So one of the things that we've seen uh, in this video playlist is that vector bundles correspond to locally free sheaves. And it turns out that if you want to understand at least line bundles, so rank one vector bundles, um, it's sometimes useful to think of them in terms of the sheaves instead. Okay? And the corresponding sheaves are what are called invertible sheaves. And the reason for that, and that's what I want to show you in this video now, is that uh, they can be realized actually uh, as invertible sheaves of rational functions. Okay? So you can uh, exhibit them rather concretely. Okay, so let's see how we do that by looking at uh, firstly what's called the constant sheaf of rational functions. Okay, so what is that? Okay, uh, so our setup will be x is some quasi projective variety over an algebraically closed field k. And then, as usual, to uh, look at uh, coherent sheaves and quasi coherent sheaves, uh, we work with some open affine cover given by these uis. These uis are affine, so they're really uh, given by the coordinate ring, which I'm going to denote with this ri. Okay, so uh, we'll have k, that's k of x, that's just a field of rational functions on x. And if you want to see concretely, uh, another way of looking at it is it's just a fraction field of this commutative domain Ri. Okay? So we're going to assume this variety, of course, is irreducible so that we can, these are all domains. Okay, so let's come to the definition of the constant sheaf of rational functions on x. Okay, and this is going to be a quasi coherent sheaf. It's going to be given by this um, calligraphic K. Most of these sheaves are denoted by calligraphic symbols. Okay, so we'll use that there. And we'll uh, do it in terms of descent data, what this quasi coherent sheaf is. So I have to give you an RI module on HUI. So what's that RI module? Well, that RI module is just going to be K. Okay, it's just going to be the uh, uh, field of fractions. So, of course, this uh, K is indeed just the field of fraction that's in Ri. So, in particular, it's an Ri module. Okay, and so that's what it is on each of them. Okay, and I guess the other thing that you need to do is to give some sort of a uh, descent data. So, how do you glue on the intersection of Ui and Uj? Well, in both cases, they're just equal to this K. Okay, and so you just have the identity essentially. Okay, so that's what's going on there. And if you think about that, so this is a constant k on each ui. And in fact, if you uh, go through the sheaf property, you'll find that this uh, uh, sheaf is actually a constant k on every non-empty uh, open uh, u inside x. Okay, so that's why it's called the uh, constant sheaf of rational functions. Okay, so let's see how that's useful uh, for studying um, invertible sheaves. So remember, invertible sheaf, what's that? That's just a locally free rank one um, sheaf. So basically, it's the sheaf corresponding to a line bundle. Okay, and what this proposition tells us is that L is isomorphic to a subsheaf of this constant sheaf K here. Okay, so if you know this sheaf very well, Okay, that means that you can really have a way of understanding all uh, invertible sheaves and hence all line bundles. Okay, so that's a very, very te useful technique. And the good thing about this is that this really is just uh, something that's fairly familiar because we're just talking about rational functions on x. So it's not that complicated. Okay, it is in this more complicated uh, sheaf setting, but nevertheless, it is something that we have some feel for. Okay. So once you are given this part A, that, that's true, um, part B actually follows fairly nicely and gives us a way to really think about what is a line bundle, okay, and also uh, the corresponding invertible sheaf, okay. So the first thing is that um, being an invertible sheaf, it's locally free of rank 1, so it's actually uh, free of rank 1 on a sufficiently fine open affine cover. So suppose UI is sufficiently fine now, so that it's actually free of rank 1 on all those UIs. So it's free of rank 1 on all of those UIs. What does it mean? That means on UI, it's some RI module which is free. So it's generated by a single element, and we can call that FI. And the point is that since this is now a subsheaf of K, this FI you can pick in, inside um, the sections of K over U. Okay, so what is K on U? Well, it's just this um, Roman K here. Okay, so it's just this uh, fraction field here. So FI is just a rational function. Okay. So that means that uh, you can think for this L, for some sufficiently fine open affine cover on UI, it's just FI times RI. And I guess uh, now you've also uh, said that this is a subsheaf of K, so the uh, descent data is induced from the descent data inside this um, constant sheaf of rational functions here. Okay, so in particular, uh, what you have essentially that uh, descent data is just equality inside this K, 
So what you can do is that inside ui intersect uj, okay, so let's look at the coordinate ring of ui intersect uj, that's uh, these uh, kui intersect uj here and here, okay, and you can restrict what L is on UI to that intersection. So that's given by this KUI U intersect UJ module. Okay, it's FI times this. And you also have FJ times this is what you get from UJ. And these have to equal. Okay, so that's what it means to be a subsheaf. Okay, so it has to agree with that descent data. Okay, so you have this um, equality of free rank one modules. And what that means is that basically this uh, fi and this fj when you look inside this ring here as elements inside this ring here they just differ by a unit okay that's the key thing they differ by a unit okay so that's rather nice that um, you, you basically to describe this line bundle all you need to do is you need to just give a bunch of these rational functions fi on this sufficiently fine open affine cover and they can't be completely arbitrary. These rational functions um, on the intersections of these uh, open sets here, they have to differ by a unit in the appropriate coordinate ring of the intersection. Okay, so that's rather nice. Okay, and it gives us a way to really give a, a, get a grip on what this invertible sheaf and hence a line bundle is. Okay, so the last part of this proposition is rather nice. Well, um, we've shown that every uh, invertible sheaf is isomorphic to some subsheaf of K. But um, is that subsheaf unique or is there lots of choice? Well, there is unfortunately lots of choice, but that's actually going to be, uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. Um, but actually we have also very good control on what those choices are. Okay, so it turns out that, um, what can you do? Okay, so suppose you have something like this, uh, which is a subsheaf of uh, K given by these FIRI inside uh, on UI. Okay, and these FIs will satisfy this. Uh, one way you can change that is that you can pick one uh, rational function, non-zero, f inside here, and you can multiply all of these by that single f. So on ui, it will be f times firi. Okay, that one's, um, we've got one rational function, and you change them all in that way, and that will give you something that's isomorphic. And that's pretty easy to see because basically the relationship between this one here and this one here is you just multiply by f. Okay, so that's all the difference that's going on there. Okay, so let me try to tell you why this is true and it's actually fairly straightforward, okay? Okay, so uh, for this L here, um, we'll write it in terms of the descent data. So on UI, it will be this uh, straight LI and the descent data here will be theta ij. Um, we're going to need to use the generic point of x, okay? So um, that's basically because essentially we just want to look at the stock there, eta, okay? So what's the stock uh, that's involved? So remember the stock of OX, uh, at eta, OX just basically means that it's the module given by all the RIs, okay? And when you look at the stock there, uh, what you can do um, is, uh, since the generic point is in all of these UIs, okay? So you can just uh, localize at that uh, generic point, which is the zero, and you'll get the field of fractions. So it's just the field of fractions here, K. And the same is true of L eta, okay? Since this is free of rank one, okay, to compute this stock, okay? You can pick any of these UIs, Okay, any of these UIs will contain that generic point, or contain an open dense subset of this X, and you can just take that uh, free rank one, um, the free uh, rank one module, okay, and you just look at its localization uh, at the ideal zero, and that's going to give you back this K here. Okay, so there's an isomorphism like this, but there's a lot of choices. We'll just pick one at the moment. Okay, we'll call it five some isomorphism like that. Okay, so how do I want to show that uh, this uh, invertible sheaf L is isomorphic to a subsheaf of K? It's very simple. I'm just going to define some injective map from L to K. That's all I'll need to do. I can inject a map from L to K. Um, I'm going to call that iota. And to do that, I just need to uh, give you a map on each of the UIs which is compatible with descent data. And the way I'll do that is as follows. Okay, so uh, uh, what's it going to do on Li? Okay, so this will be a map of Ri modules. Um, whenever you have an Ri module like Li, you can uh, map it into uh, or, or map it to its uh, localization K tensor Ri Li. Okay, like this. And in this case, it's going to be injective because uh, well, what is this? This is free of rank one. Okay, so that means. Um, uh, this has to be injective. Okay, so this here, remember, is um, essentially, this is another way of viewing just the stalk of this L 
uh, at this eta because we're tensoring over the um, fraction field k here. Okay, so that's the stalk of L eta here. And then we can compose this map with our chosen map phi here. Okay, so there's a little bit of choice involved in this, what this iota is. It involves this phi here. And then you'll see that, yes, this is a map. And because it's defined using localization, and that's functorial, okay, it's going to be compatible with descent data. And that will map you to, so, so remember this k also is what this uh, sheaf is here on ui. Okay, so that's the ri module uh, giving what this sheaf is on ui. So on ui, uh, you needed an ri module map from li to k. And we've given this ri module map here. And it's compatible with descent data. And that gives you a morphism. It's injective on each ui, so it's actually injective. Okay, and that proves part A easily enough. And the point is that, um, of course, if you want to change this amorphism, okay, there isn't uh, much you can do. Uh, essentially, uh, if you want to change this, the only thing you can do is to change this phi. So basically, you'll have an RI module uh, homomorphism K to itself, and the only types of uh, module homomorphisms like that are just multiplications by uh, functions in F. Okay, so the only thing you can do is to say, okay, where does one go to? Okay, in this uh, new phi, okay, if you change where one goes to, okay, and that will give you some other rational function f, which is non-zero, and that's your choice. Okay, so it's a little bit uh, unfortunate, maybe you think that there's a little bit of sloppiness in the choice, but I want to show you how to almost fix it, okay, or to fix it a lot more, okay. Okay, so suppose now that we're given a non-zero section, uh, s, uh, of this L. And you can think of sections in lots of different ways. And the way I want to think about it here is just as a um, homomorphism from uh, OX to L. And it'll be non-zero, okay? So it's actually going to be injective in this case, okay? So I claim that firstly, um, you can use this actually to kind of fix the subsheaf uh, that this constructs here, okay? That this proposition gives you, okay? This can be used to fix it, okay? In what sense does it fix it, okay? Uh, in that case, uh, so essentially what we, to get this subsheaf, we constructed this uh, injective homomorphism from L to K. Well, in this case, I claim that there's a unique injective homomorphism from L to K, such that, well, firstly, OX is a subsheaf of K, and L is a subsheaf of K. Uh, um, uh, so L is uh, given by um, this iota. That's the unique one there. Uh, I want to factor this natural inclusion of OX and K as firstly the section, S like this, and this map IOTA. And I'm claiming that there's a unique map which makes this uh, happen. Okay, there's a unique IOTA from L to K. And since there's a unique I, uh, uh, map from uh, L to K, okay, taking its image, that's going to be the natural subsheaf of K that I associate to um, this L. Okay, so that's rather nice is that you can fix it by just picking a section. And remember these sections are in some ways one of the reasons why we study line bundles, okay? Um, they're the things which are going to allow us to create morphisms into projective space, okay? So that's rather nice. You can factor this OX to K as firstly the section, OX to L, and this uh, inclusion uh, that you map here, this injective map from L to K. Okay, so let's suppose that you use this iota as here to construct the subsheaf of K by looking at its image. Okay, so I'm going to denote that this L uh, brackets S. This is non-standard uh, notation, and it's just the image of L under this iota map here. Okay, so in this case here, uh, what do we find? Okay, we find that um, uh, now, um, as before, okay, uh, we can assume that this is going to be... Uh, Free on these UIs. Okay, let's suppose we have a sufficiently fine affine open cover UI, so that it's going to, that this uh, L is going to be free on that UI, and so the same is true of this image L of S here as well. Okay, and that image will have this form. It's just some rational function times RI, and I claim actually, what well, you can say more about what that rational function is. It's going to be the, the inverse of some regular function on RI. Okay. So you can say it's fi inverse times ri. And the reason why it's true is because basically, if you think about how this is sandwiched, okay, so basically ox maps into l, which maps to k, and we're looking at l of s.
as the image of this, so it maps uh, into this here. So in particular, this L of S contains the image of OX, so it contains 1. So if it contains 1, you see, the generator must be the inverse of some rational function, because there's some rational function times whatever this is here, which gives you 1. Okay. So, so that's the reason. So remember, it has this form, okay? And if this uh, here, okay, so maybe I should have used a different uh, letter here. If this contains one, okay, if this module here contains one, uh, that means that this thing here times some actual uh, regular function is equal to one, so this must be the inverse of that regular function, okay? So that's rather nice is that you have even more information in this case. So um, the... Uh, invertible sheaves which have non-zero sections actually uh, are special. Okay, not every invertible sheaf will have a non-zero section. Okay, and we've seen that before, and this is one of the consequences of having a non-zero section: is that uh, the subsheaf, the corresponding subsheaves that you get, okay, will be special. So the other thing that's very important when we study um, sections of line bundles or invertible sheaves is looking at their zeros. So in this case here, it's actually quite easy to see what the zeros are. The zeros of S, if you restrict it to this UI, it's given by this form here. Very simply, you just take this uh, regular function FI and you look at the zeros of FI and that gives you what it is. And the reason why is it's quite simple to see that if you're away from the, uh, the, the poles of F in, uh, uh, inverse, so in other words, away from where FI equals zero, okay, essentially you'll get an isomorphism here. Okay? So they're going to be the same, and so the zeros aren't there. Okay? So this is a rather nice addendum which tells us actually a very close relationship between firstly sections, uh, so invertible sheaves, sheaves and non-zero sections, and actual invertible subsheaves of this sheaf of rational functions. There's quite a bit of theory in what we've set up so far, but I hopefully this following example will clarify what's going on. Okay, so here what we'll look at is this uh, uh, irreducible uh, projective variety, P1, that's going to be my X, and to look at coherent sheaves on this, I'll write it as the union of an affine line A1Z and the affine line A1Z inverse. Uh, later we'll have to pick the point P where Z equals zero in this affine line here. Okay, and to give a section, uh, we'll have a look at this line bundle OZ. Okay, so what is this, uh, or ON rather, uh, what is this line bundle? So it's going to be trivial on this affine open cover, so it will be KZ on A1Z and KZ inverse on A1Z inverse. And the descent data though for this ON is going to be given by uh, multiplication by z to the minus n. So that's a unit here. So that's a, a reminder of what this on is. And we want a morphism from O to this. So O, of course, is just the uh, coherent sheaf, which is kz on a1z, kz inverse on a1z inverse. And it's just the identity here. Okay. So we've seen that uh, the morphisms from O to on, they're given by essentially on this a1z patch here, uh, a multiplication by some polynomial of degree less than or equal to n. And we'll just pick one example here to give a good illustration of what's going on. So let's suppose we just multiply here by z to the n. Okay, so let's restrict this now to this intersection of the two patches. So as a kzz inverse module, um, what's happening here is just multiplication by z to the n. Uh, z to the n plus n rather. So let's just fix that. Z to the plus n. And then uh, you have to have compatibility of this square. So if you go around this one, you multiply by z to the n and z to the minus n. So basically you don't do anything, you multiply by 1. So going around this way, you also have to multiply by 1. So on this patch, uh, you're multiplying by 1. Okay, so there's a morphism um, from O to ON. So there's a non zero section of this uh, invertible sheaf ON. So let's analyze it a little bit uh, more carefully on this A1Z patch and see what we did yeah, on the, um, uh, in the setup before to see uh, what is the corresponding invertible subsheaf of the sheaf of uh, rational functions, the constant sheaf of rational functions. Okay, so on this patch here, we're going from O to ON. O is K of Z, uh, ON is also K of Z, but the map here is multiplication by Z to the N. 
And what we do now is we look at the stalk at the generic point. Okay, so we're basically going to the function field, which is um, k of z, the field of rational functions in one variable, k of z, and that's the case in both of these here. And looking at the stocks, this is functorial, so there's also a morphism from here to he here, which induces a morphism from here to here, which is also just multi multiplication by z to the n. So here we have the inclusion of O into the uh, sheaf of uh, the constant sheaf um, of rational functions. Okay, and it's going to factor uh, by firstly this map here, the section, and also the corresponding injection of this. Okay, so this is going to be a subsheaf of this. Okay, so how does it this inject inside here? What's the map that's going around this way? Okay, well this is uh, freely generated by one. So let's just track where one goes, and that will tell you where the generator goes. So you start with one here. This is just inclusion here, so that maps to one here. But this map here is multiplication by z to the n. So to go back, of course, you just divide by z to the n, so you get z to the minus n. So what's the image of this inside here? Well, this is just k of z times everything in one, and one gets mapped here, so it's basically k of z times z to the minus n. Okay. So I've written that down here. It's just k of z times z to the minus n. That's the image of this on inside here in this patch on a1z. So the image of this on inside uh, this uh, constant shift k of uh, rational functions, um, I'm going to denote by onp, p being the point z equals 0. And this is fairly standard notation. Uh, we'll see what it means in general in another uh, video in this playlist. But um, uh, for the moment, I'll just introduce the notation as is. Okay. So what is this ONP on this patch here? We've said what it is. Okay. It's going to be a, uh, a sub-module of the KZ module here. So this is K square bracket Z. We think of this as a uh, module of a, this ring here, this sub-ring here. Okay. And what um, sub-module of this is it? It's the, this uh, sub-module here, Z to the minus N times K of Z. So it's going to be a free KZ module and the generator is z to the minus n, because that's the image of 1 here. Now we can do a similar sort of thing on this other patch a, over a1z inverse. Here, instead of a z to the n, you've got 1 here. So as you can imagine, or, uh, what happens is that you will just get that uh, the, the image of the map, when you replace the z to the n with 1, is just going to be, k, uh, and this k of z with k of z inverse is just k of z inverse. Okay, so what's the upshot? So it's quite easy actually to see what's going on here. Okay, how do you describe the rational functions here and here? Okay, one way that's very nice to describe them is uh, well, which uh, uh, rational functions are you looking at here? Well, the nicest way to describe these is actually these rational functions are regular everywhere except for possibly at uh, z equals zero, the point p here. At the point uh, z equals zero, there's a po there's possibly a pole there of order up to n, but otherwise it's going to be uh, regular. Here, this patch doesn't include that point. So here is just the regular functions. Okay. So one way to describe this, uh, this sheaf, and that's, this is a very, very nice way to describe this sheaf, is it's just a sheaf of rational functions where um, it's going to be regular everywhere except possibly at a pole of order at most n at this p. Okay. So that's rather nice. If you didn't really get a good feel for what is this on before, right? What we've done here is that we've found a way to embed it into a sheaf of rational functions, and we can really say what those rational functions are, and so get a bit of a concrete feel for what this um, invertible sheaf is. It's just a sheaf of all uh, rational functions which are regular everywhere except possibly at p, but at p we want to bound the order of the pole there, and that bound is going to be n. Okay, and that gives us a, a lovely description way of thinking about this uh, um, on as this subshift ONP here. So that's the um, isomorphism. And the isomorphism is induced by this uh, um, section here. Of course, we could have picked any polynomial of degree less than or equal to n here, and that gives us other choices, um, so other subsheaves of this k here. Okay, that's great. So let me just finish off this remark. Okay, so what we've seen is that if you have a um, invertible sheaf L um, and also a section, Okay, what you'll end up is this associated isomorphic copy of it, um, so an invertible subsheaf of this sheaf K here, right? And you can say, oh, that's very nice. I mean, can you go backwards? If you're given this, um, 
do you get something like that? Well, not quite. You do lose a little bit of inf information, okay? Um, going from here to here, okay? There'll be times when you can change, um, not the L, but if you change the S slightly, you'll get the same thing, okay? And what can you do to change this S? One of the things that you can do to change the S that really doesn't change anything is that you can firstly have some automorphism of this O here and then apply this S, okay? So the group of automorphisms of this OX, what you can do is you can multiply this OX by some unit, some global uh, unit, okay? And that's going to be the automorphisms of that. I won't dwell on that too much more, but that's something that to, to keep in mind. If X happens to be a projective variety, an irreducible projective variety, then uh, it turns out that this will just be uh, K. And if this is just K, that's quite small, okay? So that means that really, um, a modular is something that's quite small, okay, that you can really control, okay? Uh, one way to think of this data here, and this is important data, right? When you think about uh, line bundles, you're interested in sections on them to create morphisms into projective space, okay? You're just basically thinking about invertible subsheaves of this K. Okay, great. So that's the first thing. And the second thing that uh, comes up from this example here that's kind of very important is that, well, how do you think about these invertible subsheaves of uh, uh, K, okay? And the key point is that if you look at any patch, like I've done here, or I've done here, okay, you'll get something. Um, if it uh, is trivial there, okay, you'll get something like this, Fi inverse Ri. And really, uh, to understand this fractional ideal, okay, uh, as per this description here, all I need to just say is, um, you look at this Fi, or the Fi inverse, and we talk about the uh, location and the order of the poles and zeros there. That's going to be a key thing, which allows us to look at this fractional ideal. And once we understand that, we can understand this, and that basically, uh, these invertible subsheaves of K, okay, they're very, very closely connected with uh, a pair of, firstly, an invertible sheaf and a section of it. Okay. And this gives us a wonderful way of trying to understand invertible sheaves and hence line bundles, okay, by exhibiting them concretely as a sh sheaves of rational functions. So that's the first thing that's rather nice. And the second thing that's rather nice is that um, it actually tells us a lot of information and it also records the actual section uh, modulo this uh, action of this group here. Okay. I hope you enjoyed this adventure in pure mathematics.